ان الحمد لله نحمد ونستعين ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله indeed all praise is due to allah and as such we should praise him seek his help and seek his forgiveness and seek refuge in allah from the evil which is within ourselves and the evil which results from our deeds for whomsoever allah has guided none can misguide and whoever allah has allowed to go astray none can guide and i bear witness that there is no god worthy of worship but allah who is alone and without partner the beginning and the end and i bear witness that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the last messenger of allah in the asdaq al hadith kitab allah the most truthful form of speech is the book of allah the quran wa khair hadith hadju muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the best source of guidance was that guidance brought by muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in his sunnah wa sharra al umur muhdathatuha and the worst of all affairs in this life are the innovations in religion fa inna kull muhdathatin bid'ah because every innovation in religion is a cursed innovation wa kull bid'atin dalala and all cursed innovation all really innovation in religion whether we think it's cursed or bad or not it is all cursed and as such it is a source of misguidance it is a source of misguidance wa kull bid'atin fin nar wa kull dalalatin fin nar and all misguidance leads ultimately to the hell fire brothers and sisters <clears throat> in the previous khutbah we were looking at or continuing to look at ad dajjal his story didn't end where we stopped but it continues we said that we would know of his coming by a major global sign drought in every corner of the earth for one year having been preceded by drought over two thirds of the earth the year before and drought in one third of the earth the year before that so until these signs appear anyone's claims concerning dajjal if they're not in line with the hadiths that we have presented know that they're false know with certainty that they're false prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was given an assignment with regards to dajjal which was not given to the prophets before him 
All of the prophets, Prophet Muhammad said, all of the prophets warned their followers of Dajjal and his coming. They all warned them. But all of the previous prophets were sent to particular people in particular places for particular periods of time. So the message which they brought, of which the warning of Dajjal was a part, became distorted in time. Time passed, additions were made, deletions were made, till the message became so distorted that another prophet needed to have been sent. So it is not surprising when we go to look at the information concerning Dajjal in Christian scripture and in Jewish scripture, that the description is very garbled. It is unclear. Names pop up. Some descriptions are there, but they're wild descriptions. Incomprehensible. So weird and strange that people have interpreted them in no end of different ways. Whereas the job of Muhammad وسلم, being the last of the messengers of Allah was to make the story of Dajjal so clear, so precise, that no one who followed him would have doubts about his coming, who he is, etc. until he comes. So Prophet Muhammad وسلم, left for us very clear descriptions. Right down to the color of his eyes. And that is why we should not be deluded, fooled, misguided by the modern interpretations that you might find on YouTube or you might find from this uh, speaker or that speaker. We have enough in Qal Allah wa Qala Rasul Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have enough there to give us such a clear picture, there is no need to look anywhere else. So, the signs of his coming were clear. And we talked in the previous khutbah about the powers which Allah had given him. He is the Antichrist. So he will do things like what Jesus did. Jesus who is the Christ. The Messiah, Al-Masih, the true Messiah. He will bring life to the dead. He will bring out the treasures of the earth. He will cause the sky to rain at his command. It's Allah who actually causes it. And he will have with him, we said, a mountain of meat and a mountain of bread. Basics following him wherever he goes on the earth. Where people will be starving. And he will call those who believe in him to benefit by what appears to them to be miracles. Not only will the sky rain, but 
the plants will grow before their eyes and will bear fruit and their animals the few remaining animals will become plentiful fat others filled with milk the sheep and he will in different places in the earth to demonstrate his powers of bringing life back to dead will call young men and then chop them in half walk between the halves to clarify this is not like the magicians that we see you put people in a box and you see them sawing and they separate the halves okay they have fake feet in one half or somebody's hiding inside cuddled up and they put their feet out even so they can move their toes however tricks there's no box he will chop the people right in half and he will walk between the halves then he will turn and tell them to come and they will come together and come running smiling before him giving life to the dead furthermore he will have with him gardens which appear to be gardens from paradise however we perceive gardens of paradise he will have with him something that looks like what should be a garden from paradise of course we have never seen paradise and whatever we imagine is not what it is but still we have an idea in our minds we've read the Quranic verses we've heard the, the prophetic descriptions so we have in our mind this vague idea of paradise so there will appear with him what appears to be a garden from paradise as well as flaming pits from the hellfire and from both of these will flow rivers a river from the garden of paradise which will appear cool white and from the pit of hell there will be a river of liquid fire and when he camps outside of Medina an incident will take place an incident which Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put special uh, special uh, emphasis on he had been as we said before cutting people in half and calling the halves together but when he appears outside of Medina Abu Sa'id al-Khudri had said a man from among the believers will come to him and he'll be met by armed forces of Dajjal and they will ask him where are you headed he will reply I'm heading to the one who has appeared they will say to him don't you believe in our Lord he will reply our Lord is well known and they will say kill him but some among them will say to the others didn't our Lord forbid us from killing anyone without his knowledge so they will take him to Dajjal when the believer sees him he will proclaim O oh people this is Dajjal whom messenger the messenger of Allah had mentioned Dajjal will order that he be laid on his stomach and his head smashed his back and stomach will be severely beaten and then he will be 
asked by Dajjal, don't you believe in me? He will reply, you are the false messiah. Dajjal would then order that he be sawed in half from his head to his crotch. Then Dajjal will walk between the two halves and say, arise, and they will arise. And he will ask him when he appears back before him, do you believe now? And the young man will say, my certainty about you has only increased. Oh people, he won't be able to do this again to anyone after me. The Jaw will then grab him in order to cut his throat, but his entire neck will be covered by a band of copper which will prevent him from doing so. And then the Jaw will grab him by his hands and his feet and throw him into the river of fire, the river coming from the pit of hell, what appears to be the pit of hell. And he will be consumed by that fire. And of course people will think he was destroyed. However, the Prophet ﷺ informed us that that pit of fire, that river of fire are actually from paradise. And that he, when he was thrown into what appeared to us to be the pit of fire, was in fact falling into paradise. So if you see the Jal, if you happen to be caught in that occasion and you have nowhere to run, then know that you run for what appears to be the river of fire. Of course, the kind of iman that it will take at that time is not easy. Because the fire will appear as real as real can be. And the Prophet Sallallahu had said, هَذَا أَعْظَمُ النَّاسِ شَهَادَةً عِنْدَ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ This young man is the greatest martyr in the sight of the Lord of all the worlds. However, as we said before, this story of the greatest martyr should not embolden our youth to think that if the Jal comes, they are the ones. Prophet had said, if you hear that he's coming, run, flee. Don't think that you'll be able to stand before him. Run and flee. His reign will be for 40 days. And when the Prophet ﷺ informed the companions of the length of his reign, 40 days, and he went on to say that the first day of the reign of Dajjal will be equivalent to a year. There will be a day lasting a year's time. The second day will be the length of a month. For most of us, even that is something strange. Of course, in the Northern Hemisphere, close to the North Pole, they do have six months of what appears to be day, daylight, and six months of night. So it isn't that strange. Of course, Prophet Muhammad revealing this to his companions, of course it was strange, because that is something so far away they couldn't imagine it. Nobody knew, nobody had been to the North Pole and come back. 
So the second day would be the length of a month. And the rest would be like the rest of our days. The third day would be the length of a week. So it's a year, a month, a week, and then the rest will be like our days. When the companions heard that from the Prophet ﷺ, the first question that they asked him, first question that we would ask is, how? How would that be? Does the earth stop spinning or what? Or we would want to know the details of what made this happen. How could that be? That wasn't their question. Their question was, how will we pray on that day? How will we make salah? That was what was most important to them. Not how it happens. Prophet ﷺ said it's going to happen, it's going to happen. The hows are not important. Their first thought was, how are we going to make salah? And the Prophet ﷺ told them, Qaddirullah, estimate the time. He said that in the seventh century. There were no clocks. But in his statement was guidance for a time when we would be able to estimate times very accurately, our times and beyond. We have watches now, Asr, Fajr watches, where all the prayers are set up, Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, will even ring and tell you it's time for Fajr. These are our times. From that statement of the Prophet ﷺ, the scholars, when Muslims reach those regions, Alaska, the first Muslims went to Alaska. Now they were faced with six months of day and six months of night. What to do? Finland. What to do? So they asked the Muslim scholars and they went back to this hadith of Dajjal and used it as the basis of determining what to do in those times. To estimate it. Estimate it according to what time? Well, Scholars differed as to which time to choose. But reality is that since there is no clear definition, it is sufficient that we estimate. Estimate by looking at the nearest country or city which has a, a, a daily sunrise and sunset, go according to their times. Or estimate it according to the time in Mecca. That is sufficient. But, as I said, what was most important to them was how are we going to determine the times for prayer in that time? And this is what should be our first concern. How are we going to determine the times for prayer? Well, we don't have here six months of day and night or anything near that. Some of us may come from places where days become very long or night becomes very long, day becomes very short. So you may have questions. But for all of us, or most of us, we travel by plane. We travel by plane. Some people, if they're traveling to UK or to KL, Kuala Lumpur, or to 
Paris or Canada. They don't even think about how we're going to pray. When they get there, they pray whatever they missed. And that's what they feel is acceptable. Of course it's not. It's not acceptable. We have the means to estimate times. When a person is sick in the hospital, was concession given for him to pray all of his prayers at one time? No. And he is a person who is, you could say, justified. Prayer is difficult for him. He has to make tayammum. You know, he can't get up and move around, whatever we do, etc. He's stuck. But he is still required to pray on time. He may join prayers, Zuhur and Asr, that is available. If it's difficult to maintain the five daily times, at least at three times he can pray. Fajr cannot be joined to anything. Zuhur and Asr can be joined, either in the time of Zuhur or in the time of Asr. Maghrib and Isha can be joined, either in the time of Maghrib or in the time of Isha. But he is required to pray. Not at Fajr he prays all five, or at Isha he prays all five. This is not, this is not the way. He has to try to the best of his ability, or she, the best of her ability, to pray on time. Because Allah said, Inna salata kanat ala al mu'minina kitaban mawkuta. Indeed, the prayer for the believers is set at fixed times. And this is the first pillar of Islam that will be asked about on the Day of Judgment. Our Salah. So we should take particular care to protect our prayers and ensure that we do them in the times that have been designated for them. This was the concern of the Sahaba and this should be our concern. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring the Salah back as the most important of our deeds in our lives and to forgive us for what has gone before in terms of our negligence. I ask Allah to make Salah great in our minds, great in our hearts, so that we develop a true love for it and it does become for us as it was for Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu a moment of peace. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to spread this awareness of salah to our families, our neighbors, our relatives, and to make this again the foundation for the Muslim ummah to arise and fulfill its role as the best of nations to spread the message of Islam to the world. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisayr al-muslimina min kulli dham fa astaghfiru innahu huwa al-ghafur rahim. I ask Allah to forgive yourselves and myself. And I remind you to turn to him and seek his forgiveness for only he can forgive sins. Alhamdulillah والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. All praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah. <clears throat> At the end of this period, the period of the rule of Dajjal, where 
He will besiege the forces of the believers. There would be believers who would fight him and his forces throughout the earth. Wherever Dajjal goes, he will meet forces. Sometimes they will combine, sometimes they will be separate, but he will be fighting them throughout the earth. Though he will dominate the earth, he will not dominate every square inch of the earth. So the believers will fight him. And the main forces that will be fighting him will be under the leadership of the Mahdi. When we spoke about the coming of Dajjal in the very first khutbah, we mentioned that he would come at the time of the appearance of the Mahdi. The Mahdi would precede him. A struggle between the non-Muslims, the non-Muslim world and the Muslim world will manifest in major war. And the forces of the believers of Muslims will be led by the Mahdi. And the details about the Mahdi we spoke back then, so I won't go back into them now. But the point is that towards the end of the rule, the last days of the rule of Dajjal, he will manage to besiege the forces of the Mahdi, the Muslim forces behind lead, being led by the Mahdi, in Jerusalem. This is where they will be besieged, surrounded, and the Jal will be on the gates of the Jerusalem to finish them off. At that point, Prophet Isa, Prophet Jesus, will descend. Allah will send him back down from the heavens. He'll be wearing two white robes. And his hands will be resting on the wings of two angels. From there, from Damascus, he will head straight to Jerusalem. And he will arrive there at Fajr in the morning. And at that time, the Muslims would be preparing for prayer. The Iqama is given and the Mahdi will step forward to lead the believers. Prophet Jesus will join the front row. And when the Mahdi realizes that Prophet Jesus is there amongst them, he will step back to let Prophet Jesus lead. But Prophet Jesus will say no. Put his hand on his back and push him back to the position to lead the Salah. He said, and he will say, the prayer, the Iqama for the prayer was made for you. Lead. And he will lead the prayer. Salatul Fajr. And afterwards, he will tell the believers to open the doors or the gates of Jerusalem. Of course, they will hesitate because they're being besieged. Opening the doors is to allow the forces to come in. However, he will go with them to the gates. So when the gates open and the forces of the Dajjal are pouring in, engaged in combat with the Muslim forces, the Dajjal who will be in their midst will see Prophet Isa, Prophet Jesus. 
And when he sees him, he knows that it's the end. And he will start to disintegrate. He will turn and run. And the Prophet ﷺ had said, had he been left to run, he would have just ran on disintegrating until he disappeared. Dissolving the way that salt dissolves in water. That's how the Prophet ﷺ described it. But Prophet Isa will run through the crowd after him and catch him before that takes place. And he will take a spear and plunge it into him and lift the spear high with the blood of Dajjal to confirm the end of a Dajjal. Of course, for the forces that are with the Jal, that will be the end for them. They will turn and run, flee, because everything was dependent on their belief that the Jal was God. But remember what we said: the fitna of the Jal was not just the fitna of the false prophets. His fitna would be the fitna of the false belief concerning Jesus. Remember, Christians believe that Jesus is God. They believe he is God. But he isn't. The Jal will come saying that I am God. And of course those who have accepted that from Jesus will accept him as their Christ. Because Christians are believing also that Jesus will come back. So they will accept him and join his forces. And the Jews who rejected Jesus as the Messiah are waiting for the Messiah to come back. You ask any Jew today, what about the Messiah? They say, he's coming. However, they will not know who he is. Most of them will join the forces of Ad Dajjal. And it is at this time where the forces of the Dajjal are being eliminated that the famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in which he said Allah will defeat the Jews who join the forces of Dajjal they will not find any refuge behind anything of Allah's creation everything whether stone, tree, wall or animal except the box thorn tree, because it is one of their trees, will be made by Allah to speak, saying to the forces of the Mahdi and Prophet Jesus, O slave of Allah, O Muslim, there is a treacherous Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him. Of course, this hadith is used to show the intolerance of Muslims. Look at this, in their belief, you know, the stones and the trees are going to call them to go and kill every single Jew. But this of course is not the truth. This is the context in which that hadith was made. Those who had joined the forces of a dajjal who were slaughtering people. Just like the verses of the Quran where Allah says, you know, in regards to disbelievers, فَقْتُلُوهُمْ حَيْثُ ثَقِفْتُمُوهُمْ Kill them wherever they, you find them. So, okay, they like to take this verse out and say, look at this. Muslims are commanded in their holy book 
to kill everybody who is not Muslim wherever they find them. This is the context of war. In the context of war, you're in the battlefield. This is not the place for sympathy. This is war, life and death. So when you catch the enemy, you have to kill them. Wherever you catch them. If they have surrendered, you don't go and kill them. No, these are those who are fighting against you. Those who are engaged in fighting, you kill them. You don't hesitate. Not a general command for Muslims, wherever we find disbelievers, we try to kill them. This is a distortion. So, at that moment, when Prophet Isa completes the killing of Dajjal, and those who were with the Mahdi, who had joined forces with him, who survived the Dajjal wars, they will come before him and he will anoint their faces and tell them of their graves in paradise. And while this is taking place, Allah will reveal to Prophet Isa a revelation in which he says, I have raised a people of my creation that no one can fight. I have raised a people of my nation that no one can fight. Therefore gather my slaves at Atur. Atur, there's a mountain in Sinai called Atur, the one we know where Allah spoke to Moses. And there's also another mountain in Jerusalem, near to Jerusalem, <coughs> which is called Atur. Which of the two it is, Allah knows best. But he will be commanded to take the forces that were fighting against the Jal and flee to a tour and those who would join them on the way. Because after that revelation, Allah will then allow the Gog and the Magog, Ya'juj or Ma'juj. To come forth on the earth. These will be a people who no one can defeat. Prophet Isa, having defeated the Jal, the greatest trial on the face of the earth, from the coming of Adam till the end of the world. Prophet Isa finished him by Allah's permission. But Allah then will permit forces to come amongst humankind and devastate them to such a degree Prophet Isa will be unable to resist them. Allah has told him, you cannot stop them. To remove from the minds of the people any possibility that they could again think that Jesus is God. Because after defeating Dajjal, who claimed he was God, and the miracles that Jesus was given before, it is conceivable that some people might fall back into that belief. That in fact he is really God. The true Jesus, not the false one. So Allah removed any shadow of doubt from the minds of people in that regard. Where Prophet Isa, after hunting down Dajjal, now has to flee, to run with the forces to a fortress or 
barricade in the area to protect himself and his followers, followers of the Mahdi, from the Gog and the Magog. Prophet Muhammad gave us his description. And the story doesn't end here. In the coming khutbah, we'll complete it. But he gave us this description and told us that when people no longer speak about it, beware that the time is close. When Dajjal is not spoken about from the members, and I asked you that question before, how many of you back home had heard a khutbah on Dajjal for the last 10 years? Very few people could say, yes, I heard one. Means that the time is getting close. How close is close? I'm not going to say five years, 10 years. <laughs> we can't put numbers on it, but know that the time is getting close. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his peace and blessings on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on his family as, and bless them as he blessed Prophet Abraham and his family. We ask Allah to forgive our sins, our ignorance, our misguidance and we ask him to forgive the sins of our families our loved ones, those who have passed away. We ask Allah to give our dead relatives, friends, paradise, to give them rest in the grave and an easy judgment. And we ask the same for ourselves. We ask Allah, O oh Allah, give us the best of this life and the best of the next life and protect us from the hellfire.